Got enough. Okay. All right. We're moving along. Uh, so a few housekeeping things. Uh, as I'm, I was reminded to talk about one is internet. Pretty important. If you haven't figured out the pa uh, password yet, it's called Blast Off. All lowercase. Okay. So uh, get on there again. The hashtag for today's event is I just got nation. Uh, can we get it trending in San Francisco? <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know. Uh, so we're in San Francisco, but uh, there's some of us that actually, actually work in D.C. with Idea Scale. For those of you that don't know, we have an office there. We've had one since 2012. And uh, the government has always been a big part of Idea Scale. Uh, that's something that uh, I think truly makes us different in this space. And as a result, uh, we get to work every day with uh, people that are innovating and finding ways to innovate within the public sector. A handful of those folks are here today, and we have a couple of great speakers here to share their experience and the work that they've been doing as well. So I'm pretty excited about that. The first speaker uh, comes to us uh, as of late, uh, recently. Uh, he was at the U.S. Department of Energy, where he co-founded a program called the Sunshot Catalyst Program. Has anyone heard of that in this room? Besides idea scale? <laughs> 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 So it's actually a, it's a, it's a really, really cool program. And, and the goal, really, of the program is to make uh, solar energy cost competitive with that of other forms of energy by the end of the decade. Right, Mike? That's right. All right. And uh, uh, Mike is a rock star in DC. <laughs> Just throw it out there. Um, he's done some amazing work since we've known him. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, I am uh, honored to be able to introduce him today on the stage. So. Come on, Mike. Right. <laughs> okay, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it really is exciting. Uh, as Josh mentioned, I'm now kind of on the outside. Uh, I had the pleasure of going into the belly of the beast <laughs> and engaging in you know what we call as entrepreneurship. I think Nick kind of touched on that previously with Rocket Space. You know, teaching larger organ organizations how to move fast, how to think like startups. Um, I, I ended up in that position with the Department of Energy. So now I'm on the outside. Uh, I'm doing this with a group called Census. We're rolling out our brand new challenge practice. Uh, we have six challenges in our portfolio right now across federal and non-federal, uh, sorry, government and non-government clients. So what, what I'm gonna kinda talk to you just to frame the discussion today is really to discuss this idea of, of finding the solvers or the solutions, right? So a lot of times, especially in government, you know, we have this one resource that we look to. Maybe it's the national labs. Maybe it's the same, you know, small businesses that apply to our funding opportunities. But we look to this one resource to supply answers to some of our toughest problems, right? Now, I'm, pretty much everyone in this room is probably familiar with Joy's Law, right? Bill Joy. He, he says that, right, that no matter who you are, you know, I don't care, you know, if you're the Googles of the world, the smartest person works for someone else, right? So how do we reach those other people? And that's Bill Joy's expression of it. I like to think of it in uh, maybe, maybe a, a 90s show that people might be familiar with. It's being launched pretty soon again, called The X-Files, right? <laughs> the truth is out there, right? So how do you get it? Well, you do it with idea scale. And I'm gonna talk a little bit first about you know, what, what we can do with census, and then we'll dip, dip into the case study that was Sunshot Catalyst. So let me go ahead and kick this off here. So okay, so census. What's really cool about census is it's an advertising agency. Never in a million years did I think I would be in the position I am in an advertising agency. But what's great about it is that they started in LA and they built this excellent marketing, outreach, and client engagement expertise, right? And they found themselves winning government contracts to run prizes and challenges. So we have four locations. Uh, you know, LA, we're bi-coastal. It works perfectly for me because uh, I'm originally from Los Angeles area and now I live in DC. So we have offices in those two locations as well as Atlanta and Texas. So these are the two founders, uh, to my left and to my right, Jose Villa and Danny Allen. They met in business school. Jose had started this advertising agency right in the dot-com era. You know, they're, they're primarily a cross-cultural advertising firm that has expertise in digital strategy and digital products. Um, and, and what they realized is that in order to survive that kind of 2008 crisis, a government customer seemed to provide some of that steady and consistent revenue that would help them get over that hump. And in that process, they realized that, hey, what does the government need more than anything right now, especially in the R&D space, is outreach, is ways to reach those interesting solutions 
the non-traditional applicants, not your usual suspects. So I kind of came into this mix at the time in which they were looking to build out that capability, formalize it, and then bring some of that prize design and challenge experience that I had gained at the Department of Energy. So we formed this uh, Voltron. You know, we got the robot together, we came together, and we're kicking off this challenge practice, and uh, we're hoping to grow it as fast as uh, the need is in the market. To that end, this is a couple slides. I, I'm not sure if you can see it all, but I'll go ahead and read it out left to right. Um, just highlighting indicators as to the market opportunity in prizes and challenges, right? So we have open innovation as the kind of broad field, and then prizes and challenges as maybe a tool in the toolkit of open innovation. And what we have is we started to track the overall prize purse on challenge.gov. Is anybody familiar with challenge.gov here? So challenge.gov sounds like everybody's more or less familiar. Is, is a place now where you can kind of post an additional page in addition to maybe your idea scale page, highlighting your challenge and then maybe directing traffic to your landing page or your ideation campaign. It's a great source because now we have a single portal to crunch some data. So there's been over $64 million in total prize purse from 2010 to present on that platform. Uh, there's been $150 million total from federal government challenges. Now, why is that important, right? Because a lot of times, that's an indicator of the actual services or the market for services that, uh, that the government customer will pay. Um, just from experience, sometimes that ratio can almost be one to one. For every prize dollar you give out, you almost spend a, do a dollar in administering it. So 64 million to 150 million could be the actual size of that market. What's even more fascinating is in 2014, 25 million of that came to us. So you know, we're, we're, we're realizing that this is growing fast. Um, it's growing very recently. And seven out of 17 agencies who launched challenges as a part of that $25 million pool were first timers. So these folks are just getting into the game, they're just getting their feet wet, they're gonna need this capability in the future. So, you know, when we're talking government procurement, these aren't huge numbers, right? 25 million, 64 million, 150 million, right? We're really after the, the big market opportunity here, and I think everybody in this room is kind of eyeing it, is the $2.2 billion market opportunity for small business innova innovation research grants. So we've shown that you can use open innovation and you can use prizes and challenges to deliver innovation value in the R&D space. Now, what's great about SBIR program, it's earmarked, um, well, it's, it's a set aside, so uh, it's not kind of subject to the congressional whims of the day. Um, it's gonna be there consistently at same values and it's very formalized. It's in, I believe, at 11 agencies across the government. So that's the pool of capital available to potentially run prizes and challenges if we can provide those services to a government customer. So these are the three pillars that we kind of built this practice on. And since this has expertise and, and, a, and a good track record previously of providing these services to the government, so we have a strong business development capability, kind of learning from idea scale, how to, how to crack the GSA schedule, um, you know, how to you know, learn these special contracting vehicles to engage the government customer. So we're continuing to do that. We also are gonna provide a challenge strategy practice in addition to some of the end-to-end -end services that we've already provided. So we're gonna build out the strategy practice and I'm gonna kind of bring some of that expertise and then we're also gonna do the delivery, right? So we're gonna engage with the idea scales of the world. And additional platforms, as I'll show in the Sunshot Catalyst case study, I think that there is a role for a consultant or a prize designer to play in this super community management managing multiple platforms and constructing tailor-made innovation solutions for government clients that leverage these communities of innovators. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in the case study. So we built out uh, an end-to-end -end practice really because we had to, to, to meet these prizes and challenges needs of the government client. You know, our three areas, you know, we, we have expertise in strategic planning. You know, we do marketing very well. We do digital marketing, social media as well. And then also we can provide kind of specialized software integrations, you know, specialized websites and integrations to innovation platforms like IdeaScale or what have you. So one company handle all components related to challenges. We've established a framework um, that's kind of broken out into these three areas, right? You have this initial kind of challenge planning, planning strategy, then you get into actual building products or website integrations. Um, also in that strategy planning, or you're gonna define your rules, you're gonna define your incentives, and then you're gonna build that into the product. You're gonna then take in applications, you're gonna review those applications, you're gonna make awards, and then of course, following all that, you have your post-challenge. Post-challenge follow-up, post-challenge tracking of KPIs. Um, you know, this could be revenue, this could be media hits,
but basically you want to deliver that to the client so that they can leverage that data to run another prize and challenge. Because what we're seeing, and I'll show some benchmarking data, is that this is a surprisingly efficient and very value-driven value innovation mechanism. So enough of uh, kind of our capabilities. Let's look at some specific examples. I'll just touch on two briefly, and then we'll touch on the Department of Energy Sunshot Catalyst example. Um, this is a challenge that we, we ran previously. It's uh, with the American Red Cross. It's an annual competition. We're engaging primarily like seven to 18 year olds so that they can have positive change in the world, right? So it's an ideation campaign. The first one centered around America's number one disaster threat and that's fires. Um, there was a crowd voting uh, evaluation that determined the winner in May 2015. So that was with uh, the American Red Cross and it's called Project Paradigm. Okay, then we had another, we, now we have plenty of other examples um, for government and non-government climates. I'm just touching on two here just so you can get a feel for some of the end-to-end -end capability that we have. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the Game On Challenge, this was an app contest. And you'll see that there are even more like kind of efficient and maybe innovative crowdsourcing ways that we can do app challenges in the future. But this was your traditional app challenge. It was designed to develop an educational HIV STD prevention app. Um, we got 87 registrants with 12 games submitted as part of this challenge. So people were hacking on this, they developed actual apps that became prototypes and were started to be used and adopted by, by the community. So let's talk about catalysts, right? And let's talk about what I personally learned from that and maybe some insights that you all can share in your perspective organization. Okay, so what, why did we do catalysts, right? All good challenges and in open innovation start with a very kind of specific problem statement that has an outcome or a goal that you're trying to achieve, right? So if you're familiar, you know, 1960s, JFK gave his go to the moon speech. In a similar fashion, at the beginning of this decade, roughly 2011 or so, the Department of Energy, Solar Energy Technologies Office said, you know what? It's time now to drive down the cost of solar energy so that it can be cost competitive with traditional forms of energy generation. So in the same way that JFK defined a timeline and a clear goal to put a person on the moon by the end of the decade, Sunshot has defined a clear goal to drive down the cost and to do it by the end of the decade or 2020. And there's specific metrics. There's two metrics that they look at actually. It's six cents per kilowatt hour and a dollar per watt. The great news is that we're pretty much there with tax incentives, but we're pretty much there in about 30 or so states. So you, you start to think, well, what are the real challenges left to be considered? Well, we're there because of the drop in hardware costs, right? But the non-hardware costs are what we call soft costs, plug-in costs, related to grid interconnection, customer acquisition, financing, operation and maintenance. All these comprise up to about 64% of the cost of a residential system. This is 2012 data, so this number is slightly different, but if you're interested, you can check out the balance of systems soft cost report by the National Renewable Energy Lab. You can check it out. Look at all the data yourself. But anyway, 64% related to non-hardware costs. So we started to think, in order for us to hit our goals and to drive the adoption of this technology, how can we reduce this number? Well, the thesis is that software, data, and automation can help us do this, right? As it has done in other industries. So these were our calls to innovate, right? We have the soft cost challenge that I just explained. We had this open data movement in the federal government. Is anybody familiar with data.gov? Okay, yeah, I mean, basically the government, the Obama administration has made it a priority to release data sets to the public and make them publicly accessible through APIs. So that's now fuel for innovation. So the Department of Energy has tons of data sets. And in fact, solar itself has data sets, data assets, and tools that we wanted to build products on top of. So we had this kind of fuel for innovation. And then finally, prizes. Prizes, as I showed previously, they're increasing in total dollar amount. They're also increasing in frequency of use by different agencies. So we have all this mix. And at that time, my program manager says, hey, Mike, we have all these things going on. What can you do at the intersection of all these drivers or calls to innovation? So just um, at this point, I'll kind of break a little bit and talk a little bit about wh where I came from prior to the government. Uh, I came from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech um, doing Mars robotic rover missions. Uh, I was also looking at aerodynamic decelerator technologies. Completely different to what I was supposed to do. I had never heard of any of these things. I had had some experience with prizes and challenges, mainly because 
yeah, there, there's the famous Ansari X Prize uh, for commercial space flight. So I had some you know, familiarity with how prizes could unlock markets and drive innovation, but I didn't know the mechanics. So I had to reach out to people. We had to do a strong voice of customer. So we kind of took Steve Blank's advice and reached out to 100 people across a variety of segments related to this ecosystem of innovation and energy, and we started talking to them. You know, like, what kind of incentives would drive you to create a software product that would address solar for, you know, <laughs> these, these two communities didn't, you know, integrate at the time. So we started talking to people. I naturally, within our department, you know, we looked at what uh, the Department of Energy had done in prizes and challenges previously, and people were like, you know what, you gotta talk to Amar. Amar Kisaibadi, you know, he's the guru of prizes. He had launched our $10 million Race to Seven Day Solar Prize. So we started talking, and it's great because Amar actually came from the venture capital space. So Amar kind of had a, a, a deep intuition for what would drive startups and help them commercialize technologies in a rapid fashion. But you know what? We came up with a beautiful structure, a beautiful prize framework that would take us from an idea to a real product. But you know what? We were in the government. How are we going to move fast? How are we going to navigate the hurdles? Well, we had to bring in our ninja, Craig Connolly. Craig Connolly was the former chief operating officer at Sunshot. He knew how to, to work the contract vehicles, to cut the red tape. So we had this super team, another kind of Voltron moment, and, and we were off and running. So you know, people, people ask, you know, wh why you know, is an ex-rocket scientist, a former venture capitalist, and a government ninja you know, doing open innovation? Well, the, the short answer is to solve a specific problem. And what happens is, is when you do innovation in your organizations or outside of your organization, we often find that teams of diverse expertise produce very elegant and complex solutions, and that's what happened. So the, the one kind of money shot, if you could remember from this case study, is, is really kind of this slide. It's a little bit busy and complicated, but the takeaway is this. We leverage two communities. We leverage IdeaScale and the ecosystem of entrepreneurs that we built through that community, and then we help them communicate with a crowdsourced software development platform in Aperio's top coder. So uh, Peter Diamandis, we just saw a slide this morning. He talks about exponential communities. So if you have two exponential communities, right? You have IdeaScale, you have Aperio. Um, if everybody remembers back to their calculus classes, when you multiply two exponents, what do you get? You get you know, e to the x, e to the x is e to the x plus x, right? You get a multiplier effect, right? You get more production. And then we actually quantified that later. So how do we integrate these communities, right? Because we saw previously this morning that there's that barrier, right? Between ideation and incubation, how do you bridge that gap? What we use is prize, we use prizes and challenges, and then we designed a set of incentives that would take people through the process. So our goals for this program were that, were that it was to be lean, agile, and open, and that we would move fast. So first step, we did ideation. So we, we got tons of people involved in idea scale. So I think we ended up engaging over 5,000 active members. So we, we reached over 20,000 people we invited them to the community. We asked them to sound off about the pain points and the wish list of products they would love to see for solar. In addition to this, we had crowd voting. Uh, we also provided some soft signals and some moderate curation using tags in the platform so that people could quickly find the information and those relevant pain points that they could solve. So how did they solve them, right? And how do we develop a team around that solution? Well, we did a business innovation contest, a separate campaign linked to this first ideation campaign that addressed and answered a specific problem submitted in ideation. So you may be seeing that there's $1,000 per winner on ideation. I'll go back to that in a second at the very end and tell you how we awarded that. But just know that you had to solve a specific problem on idea scale using a business innovation solution that you submit through a video pitch. So we made a really low barrier to attract the kind of tech crunch, of the tech crunch crowd, you know, folks who didn't want to sift through like complicated regulations and you know, 30 page applications that is very typical of a government grant program. So just a video pitch and some statements or some links to your online resume was enough to get, get you in the door. Then we selected up to 20 of those. In the first round, we selected 17. And then we said, okay, you showed us how you would solve this problem. You talked about the product or solution that you'd build. You also discussed how you would bring it to market. Now build it. Let's see what you can do. And we'll give you $25,000 of kind of a credit or voucher to go work with Top Coder. So this is how we linked that ideation to prototyping. Then kind of if you can imagine these two phases are in idea scale 
And now we move into the, the Perio top coder solution. So then we engage in a rapid prototype, prototyping session. So this, this period took about 90 days. So you have these teams now who have this excellent business plan, this excellent product idea, now managing this community of hundreds of thousands of developers. <laughs> For those unfamiliar, Top Coder is a community of now 900,000 developers. And what they do is they break up a software development cycle, or a rapid prototyping cycle, into a series of contests. So $25,000 gets you about four contests. You put them on the platform, you put up your requirements, and you only pay for success. So you deliver maybe a, you have maybe a first and second prize for the winning code, you pay that out, and you get to take that code. You retain all the IP to that code, the coding, the person who submits the code retains none of it. So in that fashion, you can go from like an early mock-up, then maybe to a assembly, you know, so you have some buttons on your page. Then maybe in a prototyping contest, they hook those buttons up to some back end. And then maybe you finish off with a bug hunt. But you can see how you can go from a very kind of rough wireframe to an actual working website, if that's your example, in four separate contests. So we did that. 17 of those development cycles, we put them through the platform, ran them in parallel. It only actually takes 60 days to do those four contests. We had 15 days for onboarding and 15 days for offboarding. So we developed 17 what we call minimum viable products, and then we said, all right, demo them. Okay, we want you to demo these products, and we also want you to talk about your market entry and growth strategy, how you're going to enter the market. Uh, we had a demo day right here in San Francisco at Galvanize. <laughs> Rob, was, uh, Rob was there. He was uh, definitely a keynote speaker, a lot of energy. And after this, I'm going to kind of show a video recapping the whole process so you can get an idea of what the venue was like. But most importantly, six judges that day decided who was going to get $30,000. We picked five of those folks, of those 20, to get $30,000 in seed funding or seed prize money so that they could then enter an incubation phase. In addition to their product pitch, they also submitted a market entry and growth strategy, which the judges evaluated as well. In that strategy, they submitted a scorecard looking at key target growth metrics that they would have to hit in six months. If they hit those growth metrics, then they had the opportunity to win another $70,000. So those five people could win up to $100,000. And then what we did is we said, OK, these five people that won, let's look back at the original idea on IdeaScale that seeded this. So we looked at it, we looked at the linkage, and we went back and awarded those people $100,000. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and kind of break right here and show, show the video of what demo day was like so you can get a feel for it. And then we'll talk a little bit about a specific use case. And um, actually, this use case that we're going to discuss, look out for George, George Katitis of Gridmates. He kind of demos it a little bit. And we'll, we'll go ahead and talk about it in a little more detail. Yeah, 
It was, it was, it was a good time. It was a really special, special event. Um, it, it, was, it was actually very helpful to have that kind of demonstration of what this process was and the results um, because it helped us gain funding to launch not only another round, but then Aperio was able to sell a very similar framework and solution to Hewlett Packard, HPE to be exact, uh, and, and run a catalyst-like process for them. So we realized that this framework is generalizable, uh, you know, as long as you have kind of a data layer and you have entrepreneurs that you can recruit to kind of enable those solutions, then, you know, you can design this incentive structure and produce startups, you know, at a rapid and high quality pace. So what's one example? You know, let's get down to details at what was built um, by taking a look at George's case, Gridmates. So um, Q2, 14, so it's roughly May 2014, we kicked off uh, the Sunshot Catalyst program at our Sunshot Summit in Anaheim. And at that particular point in time, we had all these ideas coming in. One of them was submitted by an individual, Adam Cohen, who later got $1,000, um, like a year later. But he, he got his $1,000 for submitting this problem about sharing nicely from social networks to social solar. Being, uh, the, the basic idea is that I have a lot of power. I, I, consume, you know, I consume less than I produce um, having solar, maybe because I come home at work. Um, you know, after my panels have produced power, you know, in the peak heat of the day at noon, and I don't use all of it, right? So how can I share that with other folks? Interesting idea. Um, we, we didn't really think too much of it at the time. However, George scans through the platform and sees, you know what? I've been, like, trying to start this startup about trying to eliminate energy poverty by energy sharing, right? And then he proposes his business solution, and in December, he's selected as one of the top 17 to now go build out what he described at that time as a uh, solar specific app, so for the solar consumer, enabling them to actually donate portions of excess production to those who suffer from energy poverty. So based on his pitch and what he built in April 2015 of this year, um, that product came off the top coder platform and then he demonstrated it at demo day and won $30,000. So George is about to wrap up the incubation phase in which he has the opportunity to win an additional $70,000 at the end of this year. Um, I think what's great about George's example is it shows how you know, we were able to recruit an entrepreneur in an adjacent technology field. George was in you know, what you call social entrepreneurship, and now he's doing something related to solar. So another key point and success metric is that George had never applied to a government program. So we got somebody that we never would have reached. George was from Greece originally, so I think you know, what's exciting about those programmatic results, um, you know, I've just talked about, but what's more important is George's personal story. Because every entrepreneur has an amazing story, and that's what we wanted to highlight here. George is, you know, as I mentioned, from Greece. Uh, he, he lived there during the times of the economic collapse. He struggled to see his other family, you know, in other areas of Greece, you know, not be able to pay their energy bills, not be able to pay their utility bills. And he thought, you know, how can I, you know, help them kind of get back on their feet? Um, he started looking at the idea of energy sharing, and then he said, you know what, nothing like this exists. I'm going to get an entrepreneurship visa to come to the United States and to pursue this idea with intense passion. So he put it all on the line. He came here, and he executes brilliantly and is you know, flawlessly making it through the catalyst process and going out delivering this new service you know, to folks like his family. So it's an amazing story, and this platform provides you the opportunity to showcase some of those examples and then leverage that for future rounds. So it's true, we are catalyzing the generation of energy startups. Like I said, we got it approved for a second round. The Buildings Technologies Office, which is another agency in the Department of Agency, so, um, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, approached us and was like, okay, we're interested in funding startups. We would like to fund startups that, however, build on top of commercial building data or occupant level data. You know, how do we source these folks? So we're willing to support up to five. So in our second round, we had two separate tracks. One was for solar and one was for this building's energy efficiency track. And that's currently going right now. Demo day is actually gonna be in Philadelphia in December. So if we touch back on you know, some of the examples, um, another great story is Elena Fuchs. She's actually, or sorry, Elena Lucas. She's from San Francisco. Um, she comes out of, uh, I believe it's the Spun Cube, now Powerhouse Accelerator, and she has an amazing story as well. What, energy, what Utility API does is they make it effortless for, at this point in time, a solar installer 
to pull energy consumption data. So what that allows you to do is if you go approach someone's house and you're trying to provide them a quote, the first thing they ask you is, well, how much energy do you use? Well, you know, how, I mean, where, you got to get your bill out, you got to give them some numbers. With their API, you can pull that data seamlessly and integrate it into your systems to provide on the spot reliable quotes, accurate determination of payback period. It's an excellent customer acquisition device and has other applications as well. But what's amazing about Elena is that she was working at a utility industry and she was an analyst and had a similar idea, you know, why can't we get this consumption data? Why is it so difficult? And in a big organization, sometimes those kind of just fade to back, right? Fade to black. So she thought, you know what, forget this. I'm going to go out on my own. I'm going to go do some startup weekends. I'm going to go all in and try this. And she was rocking unemployment in San Francisco for a while. <laughs> but through brilliant execution and collaboration, she ran into a co-founder, and then they started Utility API. So in Less than a year, she went from being a junior analyst to CEO of a company. She went from being a job seeker to a job creator. She's raised over a million dollars in seed funding and has five, I think, five to seven employees now. So this is a great example of how, when we do this at scale, with frameworks that are scalable, right? When you leverage platforms like IdeaScale and Aperio, you can create economic development in addition to you know, high quality startups. And you know, one thing about that too, I just want to add, she tells this great story of up at night scanning bills, paper bills, to get the utility data, and like begging her friends to send me your energy bills so I can scan it in and build a model. It's amazing. Anyway. It was you no know, clear that. pain point, yeah. and mm -hmm. those are things that you know we were really magnified when you when you source those problems from the crowd because everybody starts to comment on that and like oh yeah I hate this you know solar installers are like yeah just you know just ma make it go away for me make it go away. And they started to address that problem. So, you know, outside of the other, you know, uh, competitors in the cohort and the other contestants, we have tons of press coverage. Um, you know, especially from the solar space as well as you know some of the business magazines as well. Um, the top five winners were profiled in Forbes. Um, the top five they had their own panel at Solar Power International or Solar, yeah, Solar Power International, which is like the largest or one of the largest solar conferences. So they got plenty of exposure in addition to the cash prizes as well. And when we started to step back, though, and look at our internal metrics, right? So looking at external metrics, you know, for the startups, right? They're raising money, they're getting customers, they're generating revenue, all good indicators, and we'll continue to track those. But in terms of our own internal processes, how did we do leveraging prizes and challenges? Well, the numbers speak for themselves. Prior to our challenge, the benchmark for government customers using Aperio or TopCoder was one coding cycle or one challenge. We exploded that number to 17. So we did 17 development cycles in parallel that had never been done before. We were compared to a small business innovation research grant phase one opportunity when they do prototyping. That's what it's for. We were twice as fast. That current grant is about six months in terms of timeline. We were able to do our development cycle in, in, in half that time, three months. If you're looking at phase two, the SBIR scale up, those dollar amounts can go all the way up to a million dollars. We were able to get dramatic growth and production from these startups for $100,000, so roughly 10 times as cost effective. So when you look at the numbers, uh, you know, we were able to you know, just drive value, right? We were able to get you know, lower costs and increase productivity. Um, it's, it was an incredibly efficient program. Here's a little bit of the traction um, that we got. You know, we were featured in a lot of media outlets that we had never been in before, you know, the Department of Energy getting into TechCrunch, GigaOM. Um, we had a lot of great support, you know, from some of uh, the, the White House, obviously, but some kind of, you know, innovation players like South by Southwest Eco. Um, and then we got tons of awards. It started with, it started with IdeaScale's award. <laughs> They're like, hey guys, why don't you uh, just apply for this? And, uh, you know, you had an interesting campaign strategy, so we got one. Yeah. And then we were like, okay. Well, then they're like, why don't you apply for another one? And then we got the, the ISPM Grand Prize. And that was great because we got to compete against both Cisco and Tata, Tata Global. And we had to actually pitch in front of a live audience. And they voted, crowd voted, to determine uh, that we won. So we actually had to take some of our own medicine and like, get some pitch coaching and practice. And it was a, a great experience. But we got to see how we fit in this kind of open innovation ecosystem. And I really got the feel that we had done something novel. And our, our kind of secret sauce, if you will, was that linkage from ideation 
to incubation and the leveraging of those two communities, that multiplier effect, really set us apart from the competition. Um, we got a lot of love internally from the Department of Energy, the Energy Rockstar. We got the Edison Award from Challenge.gov. You know, I almost felt like it was Vegas vacation, Vic Papa Giorgio, I, you know, I put a coin in the slot, I get another car. I mean, it was just like we just kept applying and kept winning. So it was an amazing experience, you know, like we just kind of stumbled onto this, you know, elegant solution because we were just trying to cobble together or answer a problem, right, guided by the Sunshot Initiative. So this is probably my favorite accolade is the Idea Scale comic. I showed this, I made the comic book, I, you know, I, I showed this to my son, he was able to recognize me, you know, it was just, it's, it's, I'm going to frame it and put it in my, my house. It's just, a, it's a great kind of um, synthesis, you know, in, in comic book form of how we came up with this idea. Um, this, is, this is the team behind it. So, you know, I'm going to kind of close with um, like an interesting personal reflection, right? Uh, you know, after kind of going out of the government, now coming into the private sector and trying to run Catalyst at, you know, at scale for different clients, right? So, you know, innovation is a gamble, right? Everybody knows that, you know, when you're convincing an organization, especially a large organization, to do innovation, you know, you have to have strong accounting, you have to, you know, keep track of your metrics, you have to do a lot of, like, uh, you know, culture building, you know, you have to do a lot of motivation and sell the vision, right? But I think at the end of the day, you know, you come up with the process, you trust the process, but you rely on your team. At the end of the day, you have to build a team and you have to trust that you're gonna, you're gonna pull through, right? So in a lot of ways, you know, I was like some of these contestants. You know, I, I was in you know, uh, NASA, JPL, doing something completely different, and I started thinking to myself, maybe some of these system engineering skills that I'm learning could be used to apply some, uh, uh, to solve some of these big problems that affect our society, you know? So I took a chance, I came to the Department of Energy to look at you know, the renewables and the adoption of renewable technologies problem you know, I went all in, moved everybody out. Um, you know, I moved my whole family over. Everybody thought I'm crazy. Um, but look at, at the end of the day, proposed a solution, built a team, and then just trusted that we could do, do what we said we were gonna do and execute. So in a similar fashion, you know, I challenge all you, if you've had an idea that you've been considering, um, you know, we're, we're in the business of generating ideas. Now's the time to pursue that. Now is the time to build that process, to build that team, and then trust that it will go well. So here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out. I love talking open innovation, um, and I love kind of helping organizations uh, figure out how they can do that better. So All right. thanks so much. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, I, I guess uh, questions uh, yeah, yeah. intended to Virtual, yeah, yeah, virtual, yeah. We, um, I could, you know, um, give you a couple insights from that, right? I mean, it, it is challenging, right? So you got to be able to have your kind of cloud technologies lined up so that you can meet with folks on a regular basis and do the best you can to mimic an in-person setting. Um, but, you know, for the from the government perspective, we were trying to 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 create, you know, a national accelerator, if you will, right? No matter where you are you know, we can incubate your idea. So we took a lot of heat. I, I guess Mike Seibel, you know, from Y Combinator, he was like, yeah, you know, I, I'm not really understanding this kind of like virtual model. And then you guys are using like Top Coder, you know, how many billion dollar companies have been created with Top Coder? And, uh, you know, we said, all right, yeah, kudos, kudos. You know, like, it's true. We're trying something new. We're iterating even on, you know, the Y Combinators, right? And then like about a month after that discussion, Y Combinator comes out with its grant program, $12,000 to build an MVP. You don't have to come to the Valley because they're realizing that, I mean, I'm not saying that that's like, you know, cause and effect, right? But, but I'm just saying that the, the, like the accelerator incubator model is right for disruption too. I mean, so, so we're, we're trying some new things there and obviously we have to make sure that, you know, they, they hit their scorecard, right? If they hit their scorecard in a distributed setting, then you know that means that you know we're, we're doing well if, if they're not so yeah so that we, we kind of developed that internal capability so we uh, 
had the project product managers from Imperio kind of do the technical side and just got like some reporting from them. And then we kind of managed the market entry and growth strategy, the development. So we created some curriculum and some templates. So we had them do a you know, financial model. We had them do a lean canvas exercise. So we created some documents for them to do. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I think we, we definitely reported the challenge. We reported Sunshine Catalyst, like what we were doing, you know, where to go for more information. But we really used it as kind of a channel to direct more traffic to our custom idea scale landing page, which we kind of hacked together ourselves and we, we, we monitored that content all ourselves as well. So, yeah, we didn't really, um, you know, well, the thing was, is our, our framework was so complex, right? The integrating of the campaigns, you know, the click-throughs, that it, it couldn't really fit into that challenge.gov template. So we opted to kind of do our own custom uh, campaign management. Oh, yeah, challenge.gov. I mean, right now, uh, so they're actually considering uh, doing kind of a redesign of their platform as well. Um, but, you know, we, we definitely play well with challenge.gov because that's now kind of the data clearinghouse. It's important to advertise your challenges there because then you know there's some central repository where we can see all the challenges that are being run. Sure. You know, I'm not quite sure of the relationship anymore, but I know at one time it was supported by the General Services Administration, okay. GSA, and now I think um, it is like its own, you know, self-supporting entity. So I, I think it's separated. I mean, don't don't quote me on it, but. Perfect. All right. Thanks again, Mike. Okay. That's great. All right, man. Awesome.